Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. Uh, thank you so much for listening. This week, another stellar exchange of ideas, knowledge, and, and historical facts between Professor Joseph Ellis and our own creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. I, I just enjoy the conversations between you two so much. Yeah, he's, you know, I've known Joe for a long time. We've become very close friends in the last year and a half, and you and he have become close friends. And Yeah, you you two became friends in in uh, uh, almost juvenile mischief with Ken Burns watching. We were we were the those two hecklers in the back of the room, and, and, and Ken Burns had to rebuke us and tell us that he was going to throw us out if we didn't shape up and we wound up being two of the three main talking heads in his Jefferson film in spite of our our rudeness. But, you know, Joe uh, is a smart aleck. And as you know, I am one too. Uh, And we both find certain parts of, I don't, I don't think I'd use the word smart aleck. I think I would say that you are witty, which at times leans into a juvenile phase. That's better than smart aleck. (laughs) Well, I was using smart aleck as a fairly neutral term, but that's fine. Anyway, <laughs> we had a great time with it, and we were, but we've known each other, and, and he, he acknowledged me in his book on Jefferson and said that, you know, that he had actually written the book after hearing me perform as Jefferson. And so then we've gone back and forth as kind of no, I'd ask him a question every three or four years and so on. And then suddenly with the coming of the pandemic, um, well, we had talked with him a couple of times on the Jefferson Hour before that, and then the pandemic, he sort of made it clear that he was available. And so I thought this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance. I mean, this is one of the top five historians in the country uh, in his senior years in retirement, and uh, why wouldn't we want to debrief such a extraordinary intellect? And so it turns out he likes it as much as we do. The only thing I missed today was his dog's barking. When, when we called to uh, get him online, he was like, well, I just got the dogs walked. Everything's okay, you know. So, yeah, I kind of miss his dogs too. But he, he is, you know, I've never met the man, and but he has – he he has a way of making me feel like we're old friends whenever I call to confirm a a, a, a recording time and it's I, I treasure those conversations with him he's he's a, he's a great guy well you know when you reach his level of eminence it can be pretty lonely you know he's not in an academic situation anymore um, he's been living in this sort of um, mountain retreat uh, cut off from the world in some ways and his eminence intimidates people. And they don't dare contact him. Well, of course, he's the nicest person you can possibly imagine. But I think that he is glad for this forum uh, to to play with ideas. And you know, I I can keep up with him to a certain extent and tease him and 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 it oh, helps. Please, and it please. helps. It, it helps him. It it make it helps him to to enjoy the the arguments because of the nature of the. You can hear the friendship. People say they can hear our friendship. Um, they can hear your friendship with Joe and my friendship with Joe, and I think they th- that that's part of the of the appeal. Frankly, we answered uh, listener questions, not a lot of them, because there was a lot of discussion around each question. We got uh, a question from a Virginian living in Germany. He wanted to know about the fifty six other the men who had signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, we got one from uh, uh, Ryan Baxter who is from Bath, England, asking about uh, Jefferson's marriage. And then there was sort of a conspiracy question from uh, Gina Riley, who has written us before. Uh, it was it was great, great batch of questions. So let's let's keep this podcast intro short and go to the show. But you have uh, things to talk to people about, I'll bet. My book, my book, my book, um, The Language of Cottonwoods, Essays on the Future of North Dakota, it's a synthesis of what I've been thinking about, about the Great Plains for a very long time. And then the uh, cultural tours, um, there's an online humanities course on the Aeneid, on Virgil's Aeneid in August, so sign up for that. Then there will be another constitution course in the fall. That was so popular that we're doing it for a third time, although I'm changing the curriculum somewhat. And then in the winter, we have two encampments, one on Dickens at Loxaw Lodge and the other one on Lewis and Clark in winter, which is a subject that I'm fascinated by and have written about. And then there's the uh, the Steinbeck trip in um, Steinbeck's California with Russ Eagle and me. And I just love that 
journey, going to Monterey in the spring um, is just, uh, uh, there's a sort of a, a paradise feeling of being there. So all of those things are coming, my friend, and more Jefferson hours to come. The cultural tours for this summer on um, the Salmon and the Lewis and Clark trip are full, but people can get on the waiting list for next year uh, because we're already beginning to sign up people for 2022 uh, and so on and so forth. So all of that, and we so appreciate it. If you can help us uh, to support the Jefferson Hour, um, that's um, that's a really important thing. And, and I know we have another Jefferson Hour town meeting scheduled, um, and so the people should look for that. And we're going to do a book launch for my book um, in which Jefferson Hour people and others who might be interested we can come together in a Zoom uh, platform where we'll talk about some of the themes of that book. And I'd like you to be the interlocutor. Of course, that would require you to read the thing, but, you know, so it goes. <laughs> I think I could work on that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, with that, sir, let's go to the show. Let's go to the show. And, and, and this is a fun one. This is Joseph Ellis at his absolute best. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson and his times. This week, we're so pleased to be joined once again by our returning champion, <laughs> Professor Joseph Ellis, and always good to talk to you, Joe. David, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And also the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And Clay, you and I talk a lot, but it's always a pleasure. Well, I, I regard myself by now as um, Joe Ellis's sidekick on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. <laughs> we're all Joe's sidekicks, if we're lucky, if we're lucky. Give me a break, gentlemen. Give me a break. This is Jeffersonian pablum here. We need to get to the more real Jefferson and to be more honest with each other here. I have some great questions from listeners to present to the two of you this week. But before we go there, I wanted to revisit a conversation you and I had yesterday, Joe. I called uh, just to confirm the talk today, and you said that until history happens to you, you can't understand tragedy. Mm -hmm. And then you asked if America is capable of tragedy, and I took that to mean we don't understand or perhaps we choose not to remember and reflect on our own history. Is that what you were saying? Sort of. I was saying that I've been thinking a lot about a next book on the slavery question, why the founders failed, including Jefferson, to end slavery when it could have been ended or at least put it on the road to, to extinction. And I was thinking that that was a tragedy, but what do we, what would, what's realistic to expect of them? In my life, I'm aware of my own sins and my own inadequacies and um, the things I didn't face squarely. And I really think that 30 or 40 years from now, our grandkids are going to look back on our generation and say, how come you didn't do any, anything more dramatic about ending or moving us towards a resolution on climate change? So what's fair in terms of our assessment of Jefferson and his, his colleagues? If you internalize the sense of tragedy, you're not surprised by their failure. You know, I, I think that's really uh, an intriguing and almost impossible subject to unpack uh, with any clarity because I'm going to sound cynical here, but, you know, James Carville, um, who was an advisor to uh, Bill Clinton back in 1990-92, uh, famously said, it's the economy, stupid. And if you look at slavery in the early national period, the states that got rid of slavery early um, were states that didn't have a particularly large slave population and weren't necessarily dependent upon slave labor to pursue the economic model that they had adopted. The states that were in the deeper south, uh, Virginia to a certain degree, more in the Carolinas, most maybe in Georgia, those states um, couldn't abide the notion of an end to slavery because they saw their economic success absolutely dependent upon the continuation of that system. And so we always like to think that the founding fathers and the American experiment were high-minded and that these were these idealists who were reading their Plutarch and their Livy and that they were actuated by the great principles of the Enlightenment. And all of that is partly true, but beneath the surface of all of that discourse, there was naked economic self-interest at play. 
And so you see someone like Jefferson as a perfect example of somebody who was paralyzed by this conflict, that that his his brain told him and his heart told him that slavery was wrong, dead wrong, an abominable thing, uh, that, that no rational, rights-loving people could possibly support slavery. And he talks that way quite often. But he also, in some part of him, realized that slavery was a vital part of the economic success, not just of Virginia, but of Monticello. Hey, let me interrupt you on that point. I, I agree with everything you've said thus far, except about Monticello and Virginia. If you are making an assessment of what's in the best economic interest of Monticello and Virginia in the late 18th century, they had worn out the soil with tobacco. Slavery was not a profitable way of doing business. This was true at George Washington's Mount Vernon, too. And they were supporting a, a slave population, only a third of whom were working. The others were too old or too young or too sick. It would have been smarter from a purely economic point of view to switch to a different crop that was not going to require slave labor, like wheat. And if Virginia had gone the other way uh, in the late 18th, 18th century, it, I think all of American history would have changed uh, because I can't imagine the Confederacy without Virginia, but it didn't. So it's still, to me, I mean, I, I you know, they're trapped in it, but the, uh, but the, the, if they had done away with slavery as the Northern states did, and Jefferson was morally clear about what was right to do, but as you say, paralyzed because, um, you know, he didn't know how to do it. So, Joe, let me interrupt you now, and uh, uh, because I agree with you. So, Jefferson sensed what you said that that slavery was not profitable. That you were you were shouldered with a a, a large enslaved population, not all of whom could be uh, could do profitable work, um, and so on. He sensed this, but he never fully realized it. And even to the extent that he realized it, the question was, how do you get there from here? So like today, if you had a Model T and someone came along with a better car, you would just park that Model T in the Quonset and move on or ditch it. But once you have 300, 600 enslaved people working on your estate, there's no easy way to rid yourself of that brand of economic dependency. And so for Jefferson, the question of emancipation was never nearly so difficult as the question of what comes after emancipation. Well, that was the killer for Jefferson in the sense that he didn't believe that once freed African Americans could remain in the United States and uh, they needed to be sent elsewhere because he didn't believe that blacks and whites could live together in peace. And on the one hand, you know, that sounds horrible and it was and is, on the other hand, he foresaw the extent to which racism was going to be a permanent presence in American society for the rest of, for as long as the Republic endured, and it still is. Now, all right, we, we, we haven't exhausted this, but I think we need to give David a chance to give us some questions from the, from the listeners and let, let the listeners brood about what we've just said. But just one last question for you, Joe, and, I'm, and I mean, I want you to take this question very very seriously because it's it's an imponderable but it's an important question that a humanities scholar must ask and that is could it have been otherwise can you for can you envision a way in which in say 1790 that that Jefferson and Washington and others could have led the country into a form of gradual emancipation that could have solved the problem short of the catastrophe of the Civil War. Can you can you honestly posit that as a real historical pivot that could have occurred? Yes, I can. I'm going to write a book about it. <laughs> they needed in the Constitutional Convention to make part of the Constitution a proposal that Franklin had in his pocket but was persuaded not to provide this, the principle that there was an agreement that slavery was a, a contradiction of the values on which the Republic was based and over time must gradually, gradually disappear um, and be ended. And not now, but that over time that there was a consensus on that point, the contradiction between the cause, the Republic, the United States and what it embodied and chattel slavery. 
There was then a debate in 1790 when they brought that very proposal to the Congress. And if it had gone the way Franklin wanted, they would have put on, on the books the notion that this was a principle that the founding generation believed in. There's a historian called David Brian Davis who coined the term the perishability of revolutionary time, that there was a clock running on this thing. As long as the embers of the revolution were still glowing, as long as people had participated in the movement that Jefferson was one of the leaders in, as was, of course, Washington, they knew, they knew there wasn't a single slave owner, even the ones in South Carolina and Georgia that you mentioned earlier, Clay who said that slavery was compatible with the values of the revolution. They all agreed it wasn't. And the action had to happen quickly, uh, or quickly in terms of somewhere before you got to the cotton kingdom. But it, I think there was, a, there was a road open. It required inor- extraordinary leadership to do it, but they were worried, for good reason, that any attempt to end slavery risked the union and risk the dismemberment of the Republic at its birth. And that was a genuine concern. Adams felt it most as much as anybody. And so that, anyway, you see the problem, but you see, I think there was a chance that's, that's not just pie in the sky, uh, but a legitimate shot to end it. So here's one last question on this subject. And, you know, I just was in a conversation with some people uh, this week uh, about Jefferson and race. And you know, on the one hand, I think we all get a little weary of talking about this. And on the other hand, we must talk about this. And he, in fact, is the best window that we have in order to have this conversation. So here's my question for you, Joe. Early in his life, when he wrote the bill for the government of the Western Territories in 1784, and when he wrote his draft constitution for Virginia a little earlier than that, Jefferson thought if we can only keep slavery huddled on the eastern seaboard and not let it cross the Appalachians into the interior, we will be able to solve this problem. And I think he was right. The Northwest Ordinance held when it was passed in 1787, prohibiting slavery in the uh, original Northwest. But why did Jefferson then later in his life reverse his position and talk about the importance of allowing slavery to move into the American West? How do you How do you come to terms with that paradox in Jefferson's thinking? It is the question, because with the Louisiana Purchase, he eventually, you know, he's, he's the opportunity to make the same, close the West off completely, is present, and he, he rejects it. He explicitly rejects it. It is an impossible, it's impossible for me to give you a clear answer, but I think that Jefferson um, came to the conclusion somewhere in the middle 1780s that it wasn't going to happen the way he had thought it was going to happen. He sort of thought it was self-enacting and it would have alienated him from all the Virginia aristocracy and the other members of his of his political party and um, and he simply didn't want to do that and um, and he you know I, I he, he behaved as a Virginian rather than as an American. Gentlemen, We need to take a short break from this discussion, but we will return to it in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of The Thomas Jefferson Hour. We have our friend, Joseph Ellis, from an undisclosed mountaintop place somewhere in the green mountains of Vermont. He's been sheltering there. And you know, I just want to follow up for one second and then turn this back to David for listener questions, Joe. But you talked about the perishability of revolutionary opportunity. Here's something that Jefferson said, and I know you're going to love this and I know you already know it. In Notes on Virginia, he said this, it can never be too often repeated that the time for fixing every essential right on a legal basis is while our rulers are honest and ourselves united from the conclusion of this war, we shall be going downhill. It will not then be necessary to resort every moment to the people for their support. They will be forgotten, therefore, and their rights disregarded. They will forget themselves, but in the sole faculty of making money and never think of uniting to effect a due respect for their rights. Those shackles, therefore, which shall not be knocked off at the conclusion of this war will remain on us long and will be made heavier and heavier till our rights shall revive 
or expire in a convulsion. He nailed it, Joe. That's exactly it. The moment for doing this was sometime between 1776 and 1796. And the, the founding generation played with it, wrestled with it, debated it, uh, agonized over it, and then ducked it. I'm afraid I agree. And uh, but it's interesting. I I now remember that quote. That's a that's a rare quote though. That it, but most people don't know that. But he understood at the time that he was living in a moment where things had become possible, and that the window would be closing. Washington thought the window was opening, and he kept saying, "We can postpone this until 1808 when the slave trade ends officially." But um, I'm I'm reminded that Jefferson was fully aware of the fact that he that the spirit of 76 had a had a lifespan and when it began to die the possibility of making dramatic changes went with it. Yeah, two things about that. One is that I mean this clearly uh, points to the same issue of slavery but also to, to use a really innocuous analogy Jefferson also wanted a decimal metric system and and he realized if you don't do it right now uh, when we're a revolutionary society, like the French Revolution with its Thermidor and its new calendar, if you don't do it at this moment, it can never be done. And he was right. It's true. And the, the way we measured land across the West was this weird way that, that could, if, it, if Jefferson was right, we'd have done it with a metric system and we'd have a metric system. But they, they used these chains that were, that were on a, uh, a pole to go and this is how Ohio, Indiana, all those states got measured. And once that that happened, it was locked in. Then let's move on to listener questions, gentlemen. And in fact, I'm a listener, and I have a question, which goes back to our conversation yesterday, Joe. You made a statement that sort of ties into what the two of you have been talking about. Um, that struck me so much, I actually jotted it down. You said that freedom and equality are often not compatible. Right. And this is a core argument that Jefferson and Adams have throughout their lifetime. In the Jeffersonian world and community, people can be free and released to pursue their happiness. And they, in so doing, will create a roughly egalitarian society uh, that needn't be uh, governed by any form of, of uh, federal authority whatsoever. Adams said that if you're free to pursue your self-interest, Adam Smith can tell you that the marketplace is going to produce gross levels of inequality, and those inequalities can only be remedied by government intrusion that redistributes wealth. If you're free to pursue your, your interest, it, it will mean in the end that we don't have a middle class society. We have a, a, a society that's where wealth accrues at the top, and that's what we have now. Uh, and what the Gilded Age produced, but that um, in some ways, I mean, this is a bald, you know, overgeneralization. The Republican Party believes in freedom, and the Democratic Party believes mostly in equality, and that's the fundamental, one of the fundamental differences between them. All right, then, on to some listener questions. The first one comes from Jonathan Peebles. He writes, good day to you, citizens, and hearty greetings from Germany. I am a Virginian living in southern Germany, and just this morning I reread Mr. Jefferson's declaration, as one does, he says. What struck me the most upon this reading was not the document itself, but the names of the 56 men who signed it. I realize that I know shamefully little about all but a handful of those men. Would it please you to recommend a few books that were written either by them or about them, especially the lesser known in the fold? I am sure that there is much to be gleaned from those who, with justification or without, stand in Jefferson's historical shadow. I'll go first, uh, and I'll be the cynic here. I, and I, I'll be very interested to see if, if Joseph Ellis agrees with me. We, we basically know the ones we need to know. In other words, the ones that, that played an important role in the founding and the early national period are very well known. A few of them deserve to be better known, but it's not that they've been forgotten. And the ones that we don't know, we don't need to know, essentially. <laughs> it's a harsh judgment, but I'm afraid it's true. I mean, a lot of those people who you don't recognize, um, life didn't turn out that well for them. There was there were some people, usually their ancestors, that have probed into their lives 
There are not really, I mean, there's people like John Dickinson that ought to be better known. And there's a couple of good books on him recently. But the major founders are seven people. <laughs> George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, um, James Madison, and I would put in John Marshall in there too. They're the ones that shape the, in, the, shape the arguments, and it is for that reason that they're the ones we remember. And I had this sort of come up in a similar context. I was giving a talk on Lewis and Clark for a Zoom event recently, Joe, and someone said, well, um, you know, uh, what, why don't we know more about people like um, Hugh Hall and Silas Goodrich and John Thompson and so on? And I said, well, you know, if you comb the, the journals of Lewis and Clark, you can find out that this person got um, injured with a knife and that guy got drunk one day and somebody else, uh, when they were hungry, hunted for an elk and, and was successful or this person got lost on such and such an occasion. But but we don't have their memoirs. They didn't know we'd be interested. Most of them disappeared quietly back into private life in Missouri or Kentucky or Pennsylvania. A few of them, like John Coulter, went on to be a big deal. But for the most part, they're... They were grunt laborers and non-entities, and although we, don't, we, of course, we would like to have each of of their memoirs, we don't, and so we're sort of stuck with what we have. The same is true. I'm just looking at a list of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Tell me which ones you know: New York, Lewis Morris, Francis Lewis, William Floyd, Georgia, Button Gwinnett, uh, George Walton. We know the Virginians: Richard Henry Lee, Francis Lightfoot Lee. Uh, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Jefferson, George with Thomas Nelson Jr. Those Virginians, as as Adam said, they're all swans, Joe. They're all they're all swans. Virginia, all geese are swans. But you know, New Jersey, Abraham Clark, John Hart. Uh, we know Francis Hopkinson. He's important. Richard Stockton, not so much. John Witherspoon, we know him. He was the um, president, president of, of Princeton. Yeah, Princeton. Yeah. But you know, yeah. Charles Carroll, we know from yeah, Maryland. Yeah, well, one of the things that happened that I, I remember being on a Charlie Rose show once and he said, well, why do you, you know, why do you focus on these founder guys? And um, I said, because we know so much about them. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you can't write biography people, people who haven't left you a, a substantial body of, uh, of evidence in the way of letters, diaries, documents. And the, the men that I mentioned have left us with the largest depository of, uh, information and evidence for any political elite in recorded history because they all knew they were going to be significant and they preserved them. And then these editorial projects that began in the 20th century have, uh, have really preserved them forever. And um, so we've got this incredible amount of evidence about the few, if you will, and the others we have almost nothing about. And that's the reason we know that the, the former and the don't the latter. So, so Joe, let me ask you this relatively easy question. Over or underrated John Hancock? Over. Over or underrated Samuel Adams? Under. Over or underrated Richard Henry Lee? Mm -hmm. Depends on who you're talking to. In Virginia, over. Outside, then nobody knows him. And um, under. So this is now like the McLaughlin group. Wrong. <laughs> wrong. You are, you are wrong, sir. You think he's important? Uh, no. Well, Richard he's... Henry Lee's important because he drafted the document. He drafted the resolution for independence. That is certainly true. How, how about uh, Caesar Rodney of Delaware? <laughs> uh, he's a character in a in a Shakespearean play that that would be a minor character of great interest, but he you know he, he shows up to vote in, in the nick of time in uh, in one of the votes in the Congress. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I could do something with him if I was a novelist. I couldn't do much with him if I had to write nonfiction. Just three more and then we'll move on. Uh, these, it gets more fun now. Benjamin Franklin, overrated or underrated? Uh, underrated. James Wilson, over or under? Under. Benjamin Rush, over or under? Under. Okay, the last one. John Adams. <laughs> It used to be under until some of us have revived him. 
You know, you almost single-handedly lift him out of his deserved obscurity into something like national prominence. I I made him my 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 guy, and um, and uh, and the people that have really got to know him probably have done so through David McCulloch's book that came after mine, and and uh, and exposed him to an even larger readership, and then the HBO series that came on the basis of the McCulloch book. So. Um, I'd like to take some credit, but David, uh, whose health is not good, I'm told, uh, probably deserves the lion's share of it. That's very generous of you. Thomas Jefferson, over or underrated, Joseph Ellis, and do you wish to come back on this program? <laughs> um, I mean, he can't be overrated. And um, I, th- I mean, I think that um, he is the single most resonant figure who wrote the magic words of American history about equality and who also stood on the wrong side of the uh, race issue. And so he is, if you don't understand Jefferson, you don't understand American history. But we are more disillusioned with Thomas Jefferson than with any other founding father. How did that ever happen? Well, we're simultaneously more inspired and more disillusioned. I mean, if you listen to both sides of Jefferson here and, um, I mean, those that want to destroy the Jefferson Memorial or take his face off Mount Rushmore, I think they, they're they misguided. Uh, if you lose Jefferson in the American dialogue, um, you lose the promise that is the basis for what Martin Luther King's dream is, all, is based. I will move on to another question, if I might, gentlemen. We have a question from Gina Riley, who has written to us before, I believe, And actually, she wrote this letter to President Jefferson, and it's about the Haitian Revolution. And she says, it it sounds like you got pretty chummy with Napoleon on the QT. It made me wonder how much this may have contributed to the Louisiana Purchase being such a good deal. It's a bit of a conspiracy theory letter. She she believes that uh, the Democratic Revolution was good unless it's black slaves revolting, so there's no good side of this to be on politically. In light of all of that, the Louisiana Purchase sounds more and more like a good faith gesture from Napoleon to strengthen his secret alliance with you. I don't think that last part of it is true, but, and I, I know Joe's going to have a really interesting thing to say about this, so I'll just start and get it moving. This is one of those moments, and there are about 10 of them in Jefferson's life, where you just wind up being pretty disappointed in him. So he's all for revolution. He defends the French Revolution, including the reign of terror. He says he likes a little rebellion now and then, that the tree of liberty, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to Toussaint Louverture, the black Napoleon leading a revolution in Haiti, Jefferson does what it takes to help um, crush it. And John Adams comes off better in this regard, doesn't he, Joe? He does. And yeah, I... Uh, the, Louis- the, the Louisiana Purchase wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the Haitian Revolution. So she says that she thinks this may have contributed to it being such a good deal that Napoleon was quietly propping Jefferson up. No, he wasn't propping her up. Here's what happened. Napoleon um, sent his uh, brother-in-law, I think, uh, to Haiti to put down the insurrection. And... The entire army was destroyed, partly by disease, but also by the Haitian insurrectionaries, the blacks under Toussaint de Louverture. Um, that army was supposed to go, after putting down the rebellion there, to go to New Orleans and establish French presence in Louisiana, military presence. Because it was destroyed, Napoleon decided to simply, you know, cut his losses, focus on the European uh, theater and decided to sell all of the Louisiana territory, not just New Orleans. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's this statue to Jefferson down in New Orleans that's a symbol of his role at, in the maker of the uh, Louisiana Purchase, which is true. But I say, I went down there once and said, they ought to put up a statue to Toussaint de Louverture too, uh, because without the Haitian Rebellion, Uh, the Louisiana Purchase would probably have never happened. In her letter, she also says, Napoleon was like Hamilton on steroids, so you, Jefferson, must have detested him personally, 
but he also put an end to the street violence you so detested. So while it would have been advantageous to be allied with Napoleon, the political downside made that impossible. Well, Jefferson called Napoleon the Attila of the age in a letter to John Adams. They both agreed that Napoleon was an unspeakable brute. And there's a lively historical debate about whether Napoleon was the culmination and the and the fulfillment of the French Revolution or its destroyer or, bo- or both at once. But here's a contrafactual question for you, Joe. I love to ask these of you. And I know you, you grind your teeth a little at them. But uh, if Adams had been reelected in the year 1800, would there have been a Louisiana Purchase? I think not. And um, uh, I think that... Um that Adams was not predisposed to, well, I mean, uh, it's possible to answer that, but um, I think that the, one of the ironies is that in order to make the Louisiana purchase happen, Jefferson had to abandon all of his values about executive power. This is the single most, um, the single boldest executive action in American history with the single possible exception of, Truman's decision to drop the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he was, so theoretically, neither one of these guys, either Jefferson or Hamilton, was predisposed to take the kind of action that was required. Um, And I think that uh, Adams would have hesitated. I think the New England Federalists that he represented were opposed to the expansion for fear that New England would lose um, power as the West expanded. Um, but we're get, we're still guessing. We're, I'm, I'm guessing here. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think you, Jefferson Jefferson's achievement. Think about the Louisiana Purchase is the whole Midwest, um, and yet he doesn't put it on his tombstone. He doesn't put that achievement on his tombstone. He's somewhat embarrassed about it because it violates his own principles. And because in the end, again, if you think about it, the territory that we gain becomes the Western territory over which the Civil War is eventually caused, and whether slavery should be allowed into those territories. And he doesn't want to be associated with that. Gentlemen, we need to take a short break, but before we do, just to make sure I understand the both of you, no conspiracy here, it it is what it was. Yes, Napoleon had no interest in Thomas Jefferson. And vice versa. Very good. We're talking this week with Professor Joseph Ellis and the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. David uh, and I are talking with the permanent special guest of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the eminent, um, the world champion, the reigning champion at an undisclosed location in Vermont. Do you ever see a movie called The Man Who Came to Dinner with Monty Woolley? I feel like the man who came to dinner and never left. Um, But thank you very much for allowing me back. So back to the Louisiana Purchase for just a minute. I'm going to make this little list and I want you to react to it. So this is the list of early presidents for their interest in the West. So how interested were they in the West? I'm going to put Jefferson number one, Washington number two, James Monroe number three, James Madison number four, and wait for it, John Quincy Adams number five, and John Adams number six. Can you dispute that? It's a plausible list. I'd put Washington first because, I mean, Jefferson never traveled beyond the Piedmont area of Virginia. and. Washington, as a young man, explored what is now western Pennsylvania and into Ohio and uh, understood the vastness of that of that area and its significance. And at the end of the war, said that the big prize that we've won in the war is independence, but equally big is this empire that's out there. I think he thought more about the West than Jefferson did. Will you agree that of the two Adams, John Quincy Adams was more interested in the West than his papa? Yes, because he was Secretary of State under Monroe, and uh, we forget that foreign policy in at that time involved the American interior. 
And so his thinking about how the West, the, the role the West was going to play was forced upon him by his task. So John Quincy Adams was one of the few Federalists, or he was kind of a quasi-Federalist, who supported the Louisiana Purchase Treaty in the Senate. The only one. He was castigated for that. He was the Liz Cheney of his time. That's right. But he, he, he also opposed Jefferson's policy of when the question that was, well, how do we govern this? And Jefferson basically took it upon himself, or he was granted power to be the absolute dictator. John Quincy chastised him for that and accused him of violating his own principles in the Declaration. A couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago, Joe, uh, we did a show where Clay was Jefferson in character. It was called On Citizenship. And during that show, I actually gave Jefferson the citizenship test that immigrants have to take to gain citizenship now. It was quite an interesting discussion. Clay had to answer the questions as if he were Jefferson? Yes, Ah, so it's really a test of whether Jenkinson knows the Constitution, right? That We don't want to destroy the illusion, all right? <laughs> I will tell you he did very well. But we got a letter about that from Louis Candell. I was much impressed with the questions that are listed on the citizenship test. Actually, I think those questions should be posed to prospective voters and only upon passing should one be allowed to vote? I hear the thrust of the of the viewer, or the listener's remarks, and agree with the trust. I would put it, I would say that any candidate for office at the federal level, at least, would have to pass the test. Oh, I like that better. That's good. And I'm in favor. This is you know, pushing. This is, I think, a Jeffersonian idea, but Clay might disagree. I think that every high school graduate in the United States must pass the same civics test that immigrants do. Uh, just as in order to graduate from high school. But just to give everyone a sense of how this came about, Joe, it was your idea. You had said in a previous program that every high school graduate should, should oh, have to okay. take this test. So yes, I'm not I'm not saying something original. No, but that's the reason that I took the test as Jefferson. Jefferson believed that even if the people didn't understand civics, and he wanted them to, of course, that's why he thought public education should be publicly funded as citizenship training. But he also always said that he trusted the good sense and common sense of the people, that they may not be learned, they may not be erudite, they may not even understand the system, but their common sense is almost always accurate and on point. Now, you and I can disagree with that, but that was how Jefferson saw it, that, that God, this is typical of his natural law philosophy, that God wouldn't have made us social creatures uh, fit for self-government if he hadn't given us the tool, and the tool is not... Uh, advanced understanding of the Constitution and its amendment process or the two-thirds majority for X or Y or Z that the tool God gave us is good sense. I hear you, and I know you're right in terms of what he believed. Do you think that he believed that at the end of his life as much as he did at the early part? You know, he, he eventually confessed to Adams in their correspondence that Adams was right about the French Revolution and he was wrong. And if you could project him into the future, you know, this is impossible, but you know, he himself said every generation is sovereign. And um, would World War One have changed his thinking? If he read Sigmund Freud, would he change his mind? Yes. You know, I mean, would Jefferson have evolved on this question to realize that his trust in human nature was the product of an enlightenment thought in, the, in, its, in its most brilliant phase that was going to prove utopian? Would he have done so after the Holocaust? I think that you're absolutely right. So Jefferson was able to think as he thought because he was a classically trained optimist who uh, imbibed the spirit of the Enlightenment and happened to live in a new country of self-selected people 3,000 miles away from the old world. So there were a number of factors that enabled him to uh, be as optimistic as he was. And, and as we have said several times, he comes on the other side of Sigmund Freud. And what did Freud tell us? Uh, in the simplest possible terms, there's a heck of a lot going on that we do not have access to in our beings. Well, he's also pre-Darwin. He's pre, pre a lot of things. I mean, and uh, but part of Jefferson's thought process is to say that don't hold the nation hostage to my values now because over time, the nation needs to adjust to the role, to scientific discoveries and evidence 
that none of us here in the late 18th century can possibly fathom or understand. Um, and so there's always a trap door for Jefferson to escape from, it seems to me, because the Jefferson of the future is a Jefferson who adjusts and takes into account the insights of an evolving Western civilization. There were a number of times when Jefferson deeply upset John Adams, and I'll tell you one, and you, you'll, you'll tell the story better than I can, but when uh, they began their correspondence in 1812, Four or five letters in, Adams decided that he was going to have it out with Jefferson on, on a certain issue, that Jefferson uh, had said that Adams, in one of his addresses to young people, had said that there's no progress in humanity, that we only we may as well just look backward, that all of the best wisdom has been known forever, and that there's nothing really new under the sun. And Adams really went after Jefferson on that one. His feelings were hurt, and he was angry. I mean, I'm not sure how, how exactly how I can answer that, but I but I agree with you. That was an in, that, that was the first occasion in the correspondence when they risked disagreeing. Adams believed that that that, that there was progress, that there, that life was that nations were had a natural had a limited lifespan, but there was a spiral to it, and the spiral was forward progress. Both of them believed in forward progress. Both of them believed in the expansion of knowledge. Both of them believed that the values that they were living in um, were values that uh, that were time bound themselves. Um, but um, uh, I think that Adams believed that the classics, uh, Thucydides, uh, Herodot, uh, not Herodot, Thucydides, Herodotus, uh, Tacitus, and and maybe even Shakespeare now um, foresaw some of those, and that you could learn from those things. So, yeah, so just one more thing about that, David, and then I hope we have time for a last question. But you know, I think that what when that happened, Jefferson had clearly misconstrued what Adams had said in a partisan way to try to discredit Adams and to, and to suggest how could a person be taken seriously who doesn't believe in the possibilities of, of human progress and so on. And Adams saw the, the political opportunism of that. And then when he pointed it out to Jefferson, Jefferson went into his characteristic mantra in which he said, oh, you know, these leaked letters, uh, this happened a long time ago. We were honest in our disagreements. These, uh, we, should, we should not allow this to cloud the serenity of, uh, you, know, you, you know how he does that every time they get into a dispute. Jefferson has this sort of, he backpedals in this way of saying, it's too late in the game for you and for me to be troubled by such things and by, by what sort of person would leak a letter anyway and you know mm-hmm. and so on and 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 eventually as you know the situation was reversed because fairly late in the correspondence uh, a, an Adams statement that was very deeply anti-Jefferson surfaced and Adams right. fretted about it and Jefferson said don't worry about it that was then and this is now and then Adams wrote and said when he opened the letter, it was the best letter he had ever received. He did. He said he read it out loud to the his grandchildren and, and Abigail and others at the table at the time. If Abigail was still alive then, I think, and uh, that he said it was the greatest letter, letter he'd, he'd ever received. And it was a try. It was the moment when you can see the friendship between these two different sides of the revolution, overwhelming the very the quality of friendship overwhelming the political differences. Uh, we love each other. We're not going to ever completely ag- agree. Um, and in some sense, they both realized that they completed the revolution. That is, the two of them together, and their two different points of view, were the revolution. And but that the friendship that they had, they both felt and lived, dominated any other uh, any any disagreements that could possibly. Uh, keep them apart. And it was too precious to jeopardize at this point. That's right. That's right. All right. We have one more letter that I'd like to present to the two of you. It comes from Ryan Baxter, and he writes, My greetings, gentlemen, from Bath, England. After a lifetime of fascination with the American Revolution, I was so pleased to stumble upon your show through my podcast app. He says, As someone who has recently become engaged, I was wondering if you could perhaps spend some time on Jefferson's attitude towards marriage, perhaps even discuss his own courtship with Martha, the details of their wedding and their marriage together, 
and then thanks us for uh, what he calls a beacon of decency and enlightenment, which is shining all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. How nice. Thank you, Ryan. This is Ryan of Bath. Ryan Baxter. All right, Ryan, we want you to be a correspondent on this program. We want to be able to call you and, and hear the point of view of an American who's in Bath. Well, I'm not certain he is an American. He may be an Englishman. Even better. Jefferson was in Bath. Jefferson went to Bath. I think he and Adams went to Bath, but I know Jefferson went. Jefferson was the kind of person who wouldn't find Bath very interesting, but they went, and they also went to Stratford uh, when they, they, they took their pocket knives out and, and got souvenirs from Shakespeare's chair, a kind of a ruinous form of, of cultural tourism, um, and they went to Civil War sites in England, and Adams got up on a table once and lectured the British that they should know more about their own Civil War history. And Jefferson was, of course, acutely embarrassed. I would have loved to have been a valet on that journey, <laughs> Joe Ellis, because this was yeah, like I, Mutt and Jeff. I, I uh, even though this is the Jefferson hour, I would tell this man that the relationship between Jefferson and, and his his wife is short lived. I mean, that's a short thing because she dies. And um, and he promises her about her death that he's never going to marry again, and he never does. So that's not a precedent that a man about ready to marry should look to with any uh, optimism. I would strongly recommend that he take a look at Abigail and John, and that their marriage and is uh, is well documented, and the letters between them are incredible. And uh, Abigail, towards the end, is asked by her sister whether if she had it to do all over again she would marry John, and That's she lot. says, I cannot imagine suffering with anyone else. I love that line. <laughs> I love that line. But, well, I, you know, in the, in the few moments that we have left, I know both of you could share some of the details of their wedding. So Jefferson uh, courted Martha. Um, he was one of a number of suitors, and the tradition is, and it's probably apocryphal, that they were these men were sitting out on this bench in the, in the hallway, and one court... A court, uh, one quarter after another was was brought in to be with her, and Jefferson went in, and suddenly we heard a duet, Jefferson on the violin and she on the pianoforte singing, and the other suitors uh, realized what had happened, picked up their hats, and simply walked away. That has every mark of an apocryphal story about it. Jefferson later said they had 10 years of uncheckered happiness, and I won't ask you this, either one of you, my friends, both of whom are married, but I would say that any man who would ever say that he had 10 years or that the entire marriage was uncheckered in happiness is lying. <laughs> well, but you have, you have Clay, uh, shared stories about the honeymoon and the, the trip to Monticello, and that's wonderful. And maybe we could end the discussion there. They, they, they were married at the Forest, which is near Williamsburg, which was her father's home. Then they made their way very slowly, as was the was the was the pattern back then. They would you, you would go to people's houses and spend a day or a week or whatever, and then they would feast you. And there would be the honeymoon was a social event. It wasn't you know you fly off to the Riviera together or to Machu Picchu. This was you go into your home district and you meet your friends and they celebrate you and you tell them of your happiness and so on. And then eventually they get back to Monticello where she has never been. And it's a snowstorm, and the, the last miles, according to Jefferson, they had to get out of their carriage and ride horse through the snow. And then they get there, and there's no house yet, of course. Uh, the, Monticello is just being constructed, but he has his pavilion, one of the his bachelor quarters, this small outbuilding. And they get in, and uh, they light a fire because it's frigid. And then Jefferson— Wait a minute. Stop, stop for a second. Is it true or apocryphal that— when they finally reached in this snowstorm, reached Monticello, that the slaves there, there were then about 50 slaves. There's, that slave's going to double because of her dowry. But the slaves came and gathered around them and welcomed them in some kind of loving fashion. Is that true? No, that came, that, 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 there's, there's another story where that's true. But, but no, in this case, uh, they scrounged up a little fire. And then Jefferson, by a miracle, found a bottle of wine behind one of the bookshelves. And they were able to toast each other. But uh, but the, the story you're talking about, or maybe it's it's a different story, Joe, but when he came back from France and he yeah. brought Martha, they come up to the 
to the circle at the at the front of the house, and the slaves actually unhitched the horses and and hauled the carriage up to the entryway. And then they wouldn't let Jefferson touch the ground. They carried him on their shoulders into the house, weeping for joy that the master had returned. And so again, I'm sure that story has some truthiness in it, uh, as um, as we might say, but I don't think that story would stand up to a photographic review. Well, let me let me end this by saying that I think it's entirely possible that Jefferson and Martha had 10 years of uncheckered happiness. So take that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Take that. And, and with that, I, I thank you, Mr. Ellis, so much for joining us this week. And, Clay, it's always a pleasure to hear the two of you talk. With that, shall we say goodbye? You will note, Joe, that he did not allow us time to rebut that wild statement about uncheckered happiness. Oh, now what's wrong with you? It would be un-Jeffersonian to attempt a rebuttal. Indeed. I'm, it's a delight to talk with you, Joe. David, of course, um, I'm always uh, impressed by your capacity to believe in the human project. We will see you all next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701 701- 575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.